when you really look at the notion of transactions, when you look at the history of, of the internet and what it has enabled and all that, it has democratized access to certain core functions that make up the world, right? So it's uh, programming, higher level programming language. I was very happy that somebody mentioned COBOL, Fortran. That's kind of more my generation stuff, right? But what that stuff actually did was creating higher level programming language that revolutionized the access to computer systems. At a very core, that's what higher level programming languages did, right? And it enabled many more people to actually learn how to program and, 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 and do something with these machines, right? And then in the next phase, the web has essentially democratized access to content, right? You could put content up everywhere. And then in the next phase of the web, um, it democratized access through APIs to some core functionalities that every company has, and you can expose your functionalities and quickly programmatically access all sorts of other things. Now, the only thing that's missing in the story is transactions, because the core of the world runs on transactions. What is transactions? A transaction is how two parties exchange value, right? That's what a transaction is. And when you look at the only thing that's missing in the way how today business works is transaction platforms have not been democratized. And this is what happened now with the blockchain because now it's not just this one computer and the one database, but when you take this blockchain, now ask yourself the question, what happens in the real world? So I'll give you an example from the Ministry of Lands here. Right? Ministry of Lands in Kenya has about 17 agencies. 17 agencies that operate. So when you, for example, want to transfer a land title to somebody who bought a piece of land from you, um, there are a subset of these 17 agencies that get involved. So one transaction, the transfer of value, your land title, to somebody else, takes something like 10 agencies to interact. So what that now means is that who actually owns the database, right? Do you want to give it to a particular agency in the Ministry of Lands? Yeah, can we really trust the Ministry of Land? That's the wrong question to ask in this country, but you know, but in general, right? I mean, can we do do we really trust you know one particular? Um, what if we had the ability to do what I said before with chaining up these encrypted blocks of information and run all of these transactions in such a way, but now give everyone a stake, everyone validates that particular transaction. Can Do I actually really own this property? Can I really move this property from here to there and etc. And when everyone agrees, or at least a certain percentage of people agree, and you reach consensus on it, then you take action then you lock it into your blockchain and you're done with it. So this part is now where the whole distributed aspect comes in. So the question is, can I run transactions without necessarily centralizing the access to the database that holds all this information, but can I give everyone who participates the ability to validate if this transaction is actually correct? And you do this in a computational way, right? So this is what all the mystique is about, because what Bitcoin is, is exactly the same thing, right? It transfers value, aka money, from one point to another, and you have a completely decentralized system of people, a subset of whose, the miners, are trying to help you validate this, and the consensus algorithm that is being used is, a, is an economic one, right? So they ask you to do some work before you can lock in something to the blockchain, and that work is so damn stupid that you can only do it with tons and tons of compute power. Right, which is kind of tricky because um, you know you just need big machines, you need cheap electricity, which is why most of the Bitcoin miners today are in China and in Russia, because those are places where you have free energy. Right? So, so the economic consensus though is a very clever mechanism to achieve consensus and validate if a transaction is correct or not. Right? Um, <clears throat> now. The industry is so keen on it today, and you know a lot of us are somewhat representatives of industry, former or current. And the industry, though, is looking at it and saying, well, this whole decentralized things, do I want to trust a hacker in Russia to really you know, validate my transactions? Maybe not, right? But can I run it in permission systems as well? Well, it's just a matter of how these consensus algorithms work. There are many consensus algorithms that work in permission systems, which means means there is a trusted authority and you put them in there and whoever joins the club and whoever can 
validate transactions, it's actually a trusted entity. So this is what permission blockchains are. And this is where a lot of the hype is today, right? Trade finance, banks for compliance, et cetera, et cetera. But the key thing is that um, this is a mechanism that in my mind, has now taken a further step in the evolution of the internet um, and of technology, which is democratizing the, the, the accessibility of transaction platforms. In my mind also, in the next 10 years, it will probably have a very fundamental revolutionary um, appeal to changing society and changing the way how we think about value transfer. Now, um, having this wonderful panel here, I wanted to start off by um, asking you know, each of the participants to talk a little bit about their own perspective, given that they are all in the business of blockchain and have a dedicated interest in blockchain. And Rosemary, why don't we just start with you? Okay, morning. Just checking. <laughs> Good. You know, when you're the last panel, uh, sometimes people are just off, but karibuni sana. So from a legal perspective, we ask ourselves, how has it been received? How can we move forward? And what are the fears? You know, lawyers, basically, what we are is, we hold the red cards. When any technology comes up, no, 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 let's not do this. But uh, what my interest basically is, how can we take this technology to various um, entities and actually have them accept? Right from the financial industry, we have the regulator who is CBK. We had uh, notices, I think many of you saw this, where they told you, oh, Kenyans, please do not deal in this. We cannot guarantee its safety. What is the underlying theory behind that? Why do they have that impression? And then we ask ourselves, how are other regulators looking at it? Say, Bank of England. Say, the Federal Reserve in the US. Many of these even actually have dedicated teams that are working on blockchain. So. I think the main misconception that happened in Kenya was that we equated blockchain to Bitcoin. It's like equating cars to Mercedes. You understand? Just thinking that there's only one, this is just a brand. How about the underlying technology? How useful can it be? Is it even useful for our normal currency as it is? Then Kamal mentioned land. That's another use case for, for blockchain. How can we utilize it for immutability of records? They're saying that we promise you that once this is on a blockchain, we can guarantee security, we guarantee who, we know who this is. And then uh, there's a lot of trust that is created. But then comes the other question. Uh, as human beings, do we really want that much level of trust? You understand? Like in financial systems, there's been fraud. There's been people who've gained finances in very unscrupulous ways. And when we put that in blockchain, we're saying that... Uh, are we saying that we're going to give an amnesty? No matter what happens, now do we just move on from, from here? And then do we really, do some people quarters say, so to speak, do they really want a system that is incorruptible? You know, like, same thing in the lands. Uh, do you, are, are people really comfortable? Look at all our transactions today. About 60% of them are contested any other day. So... These are issues that are coming up, but we need to ask ourselves, even as we accept this technology, we're still a very human. We have technology, but you have to think of ways in which we can integrate it. Even if it's not in one day, with time. How do we make that technology, which is so revolutionary, so secure, so safe, how do we let it fit into our daily lives? And that's maybe slowly by slowly. Good afternoon, devs. They've gone. <laughs> so, my first job out of campus was to sell life insurance. And uh, I don't know how many people here have life insurance by a show of hands. One, two. For yourselves, not for your kids. <laughs> okay, one, two. Yeah. It's hard to sell life insurance. That's, that's the truth. And... Uh, uh, I sold life insurance for Alico, which, was, which later became CFC. And trying to sell insurance was a really, really tough job. Like, you'd, look, you'd talk to people about insurance and the look on their face is like, I'm just listening to you to just be like kind to humanity. <laughs> and that's because the insurance proposition in this country is still very, very low. And I totally agree 
because it's also very, very expensive. Data has shown that up to 40% of your insurance costs is fraud markup. Like if there was zero fraud in insurance, your insurance, your car insurance, your life insurance, your personal accident insurance, your home insurance will probably be 40% off. How many would like like a 40% off discount on the insurance? <laughs> Everyone, even those who don't have. <laughs> but I'm trying to make the point that what drove me to come to this conclusion of, trying, of saying we must innovate around this insurance industry. And later on, I ran a brokerage, an insurance brokerage, and I, I started feeling like the brokerage, the agency model is not too sustainable, especially for retail insurance. And since I still love this industry so much, despite that it's very hard to sell life insurance, I decided that we must look at ways to make insurance, because insurance does have, I'm trying to plug, it's a plug. Insurance is still a very, very useful product, yeah? Like I'm sure most of us have seen somebody whose who's finances, whose uh, well-being, whose uh, life savings have been completely wiped out by an incident, so like a fire to your business, yeah? Like you didn't have insurance on your car and it's wrecked and you lose it. So insurance still has a proposition, but how do we make it more viable? So the insurance industry, especially in Kenya, faces transparency issues, like we don't know about very much about governance of insurance companies. It faces trust issues. Once you, by the way, if you look at insurance billboards and marketing, you can tell that they are still very elementary, like they still tell you we'll pay you claims, which is why you buy insurance in the first place. Why would you advertise for like uh, these guys who host uh, data and they're telling you we'll host your data? Yeah, you, you market for other things, right? But insurance companies still tell you we will pay your claims. That means there's still a huge insurance a trust gap. Speed is also a key issue within the insurance industry. And if you've had an accident and I've tried to claim, and in fact, the other day in court, as a witness, some guy was, ins was suing his insurance company because it took them six months to repair his truck, which was a commercial truck. And as a result, the loan he had, he had taken for the truck had accumulated so much he was not able to pay. So speed is an issue. Cost, yeah, there's, there's a concept uh, and you can try to look for us on, on Twitter and LinkedIn at Thomas Caberi. Look at some of the things we've written about the cost and unnecessary cost that insurance companies go through. So for example, something that we, we call the fraud or fraud investigations, where insurance companies are investigating up to 90% of their claims, which in itself becomes like a huge cost. So, so how does blockchain plug into this? I think Kamal has already explained how it shows transparency, trust, speed is also like really, really fast because you can just track back and look at who locked what transaction and how valid was that key and you're able to say yes or no, we will pay this claim. And of course the cost is much, much cheaper in terms of of running it as a software. So I think as an introduction that should be able to explain how blockchain relates to insurance, uh, to the insurance industry. And I think especially relating to fraud, which is the second biggest revenue threat to the insurance industry costing almost, we've seen $60 million a year at the least. So we, we believe that blockchain is, is a huge, will, will bring a huge leap and uh, you can follow live this evening, KPMG will be, will be talking more specifically about uh, blockchain and, uh, and insurance fraud. So you can just log to KPMG Kenya website in the evening uh, from 8 p.m. and you can, if you want to follow more. Good afternoon, guys. Yes, I come from an organization called Bitab Africa. And um, my job today is to convince you developers to 
um, look at blockchain and uh, more specifically Bitcoin. Um, how many of you guys have used Bitcoin or have Bitcoin? If I may ask. Uh, quite a number. That's a good number. About 11 guys. So why, why Bitcoin? Um, I've been a developer since 2003. And um, in the course of that time, I've developed uh, many applications, uh, most of which did not see the light of day. And for various, for various reasons, there are various challenges you face. But the one that was always there constantly is monetizing your applications. So how many of, of you guys relate with me? Like, have you, have you had a hard time monetizing your apps? So basically, um, when I discovered Bitcoin, I realized that um, as a technology, it was filling in this gap because you can go look at the Bitcoin code, understand how it works, um, see for yourself if it's something that can help you, um, integrate it into your application, and uh, test it, um, and uh, you know have people from different parts of the world paying in Bitcoin. Granted, it's it's still early days. It's it's not yet a mainstream platform, but today Bitcoin has a market capitalization of ten billion dollars after only seven years in existence, which means that um, people are valuing it. And there are a lot of venture capitalists who are in investing in, in startups that are using Bitcoin in Silicon Valley. Yet this Bitcoin is something that uh, you guys can also integrate and uh, used to think bigger, used to test your, ide your ideas quicker. The truth is most of our ideas, most of our apps will not succeed, but with Bitcoin and uh, blockchain technology, the, you know, it increases your chances of getting something out there and getting people using it. And uh, you know, who knows where you'll go from there. Yeah, thank you everyone. Um, tying into this topic, Rosemary, I was just wondering, um, you know, what you said is, you know, part of the role of, of sort of legal entities, the end of the day is to defend consumer rights. Right, to see, end of the day is to put in the right kind of, um, how should I say, well, the, the right kind of mechanisms so that users of technology know what to do if something goes wrong um, <clears throat> and have a case in court or have a way to um, have, find representations to support their own rights. Um, now, we've just heard sort of kind of John's passion for Bitcoin. What is your take on the Bitcoin situation here in Kenya, given that we know from a central bank perspective that Bitcoin is not um, on the list of things to do for the next few years, right? Mm -hmm. So, but what, what is your, I mean, where, where do you see the opportunities and also the risks? Oh, well, I'm pro-Bitcoin. I'll start from there. Because I think sometimes we have irrational fears. There's a certain way in which technology is moving, society is moving. The easiest thing would be for any person or any regulator, so to speak, is to try to get an understanding of it. And later on, how can you even utilize, say, the underlying technology? Right now in Kenya, okay, fine, it wasn't declared illegal. And if you, uh, I read the legal notice. Because I know most people usually see those things, they're like, yeah, okay, can somebody else interpret? So the legal notice, what it stated was that they do not encourage you to, to say, trade in Bitcoin or even receive it or even store it. Because what they, their, their opinion was that they cannot back up uh, that currency. How currency regularly works for a regulator is for every shilling, there's a value which say the central bank will put an equal value, maybe in gold or something. And that happens all over the world. But what they're saying is this is a currency which we don't understand because we don't have anything to back it up. And that was their main argument. But as it is, there's a lot of success in Bitcoins. There's a lot of, um, it's even reduced the, co the cost of remittance, I think, to 0.5%. Yet regularly, a normal remittance transaction, you lose about 5% of your value. How many of you have tried using, say, something like Western Union or MoneyGram? When you use uh, bitcoins, the cost of transaction is so much cheaper. 
And uh, so I think Kenyans, uh, basically not just Kenyans, but even the Kenyan regulators are very cautious. Until one day, somebody somewhere, maybe in a European country or in a Western country, starts accepting it, maybe that's when they'll start thinking about it. In the meantime, they have so many other problems to solve. Uh, Bitcoin is not one of them. <laughs> Kamal, does that answer your question? Uh, yeah, no, I mean, I completely agree that we have many more other problems to solve right now than, you know, Bitcoin. But it's 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 interesting, though, right? I mean, in, in society, usually, it takes a long time until people get sort of over their fears. I mean, it's like what um, uh, Thomas was mentioning, what... Um, it's kind of funny that a technology that was designed to address trust issues is creating so much fear, right? So, And, and I had mentioned it earlier. Uh, sad to say, when you analyze various systems, there's only trust that is required for everyone up to a certain level. That's our human nature, so to speak. It's, it's really sad, but... Um, <clears throat> What I must say is that I think it should be embraced more, even if not accepting the Bitcoin currency, asking yourself, how can the, how can the blockchain technology be used to leverage, say, the Kenyan shilling? How can the blockchain technology be used by banks or even by the central bank itself to at least have proper control over transactions, not even control, even oversight? And I was even giving uh, this team earlier on, I was telling them that, do you know that with this technology, you might one day not need other banks. It's enough for you to just deal with one bank. Why can't Rosemary Chemutai walk to the CBK and bank with them directly? Why do I need to walk through other? If there are bankers here, please don't shoot me after this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that's, uh, that's basically it. And those are the things that we need to look at. But we always ask ourselves, what does a regulator look at? They look at the AML compliance. They look at the KYC. They look at financial terrorism countering financial terrorism, and then they have what they call prudential guidelines. As techies, what we need to ask ourselves is, this, this is a straight jacket the CBK likes to put on people. And this is your technology, and put it uh, right next to the, the technology versus the laws. Then ask yourselves, do we somehow fit in here? I think that would be the best use case. Ask yourself, uh, does cryptocurrency have a tick in regards to anti-money laundering? Tick that, yes. Does it have proper KYC? Tick that. Does it, does it encourage proper prudential guidelines in regards to how, say, funds can be transferred from one? Then you tick that. Then you go and say, look, this is a proper use case for, this is a, we've proven that we can tick all your boxes, so why not allow us to, to use it? You get. Tell them, this is what you know, this is what we know. And there's a great disconnect right now in maybe, say, the financial industry and many other industries, even the insurance industry, between the regulators and the techies who are maybe talking about blockchain technology. There's no conversion, and there must be a concerted effort towards seeing where can we meet, say, somewhere in, in between. And I think that's the only way in which we'll progress from a regulatory point of view. Yep, I'd just like to add to that. On Tuesday, I happened to speak uh, in front of um, a number of African central banks and regulators. And what I told them is that the blockchain technology um, can be used to streamline um, the things you're talking about, ID, KYC, make them more efficient. Um, but speaking to developers today, this is the uh, blockchain technology, in particular Bitcoin, you do not need permission to use it. It's open, it's permissionless, you can innovate around it. Um, these regulators, the central bank, the government, they take long before they appreciate anything. So you cannot say, I'm going to stop what I'm doing and I wait for 15 years so that I can start now uh, you know, innovating. And if we do that, we'll be left by the rest of the world. Um, right now, Zurich, Berlin, um, Dubai, Dubai actually is leading. They're competing to be blockchain centers of excellence. Why can't we do the same here in, in Nairobi? So I think it's, this is a great opportunity for us. We are known for M-Pesa. Uh, Bitcoin blockchain is just taking those ideas to the next level. And maybe he's mentioned M-Pesa. It would be important for us to remember the history of M-Pesa. It had a lot of uh, backlash when it started. 
right from the bankers, even from the central bankers. But when it caught on and it was trusted, what did the central bank do? It enacted an act for it, the National Payment Systems Act. You know, they, they couldn't be left just hanging out there anymore. So that's the same thing I think I foresee even with blockchain technology. First of all, they hate you, they fight you, and then now when they realize they can't live without you, <laughs> they say, okay, fine, let's regulate you. Well, I um, just wanted to maybe, you know, because I, um, <clears throat> I'm, it's interesting to see the enthusiasm about this technology, so maybe I should be the adversary. Um, because I, I do have a challenge with this technology, quite frankly, right? I mean, just purely from a technology perspective, based on the platforms that are out there, the only example which we know that kind of works is the Bitcoin blockchain. Everything else in terms of seeing actual use cases in, in industry or in society is very, very limited. Right? Um, we've seen some major disasters right? with the DAO use case um, on Ethereum um, using smart contracts, which is, by the way, a technology that every sort of blockchain enthusiast is quoting as the next way of doing things. Right? So my take is that, um, there, or my, my stances that I'm taking here, is that there's also a significant risk Right? So are we jumping ahead a little bit in terms of the, the seeing the benefits without actually addressing some of the technology challenges that we have? And sort of the second part of the question is that, you know, to your point when you said, you know, blockchain, center of excellence and all that, um, are we here in the tech community, the right community, to start addressing these problems? First of all, as guys are business people and we are a startup, and so we don't have a lot of money to give us the runway to wait for CPK or whoever else to, be, to get comfortable with uh, DLT, distributed ledger technologies, for us to be able to try monetize. So therefore, what we've, we've tried to do is look for low risk, uh, of course, there are, there are huge risks in doing like global distributed ledgers. So look for low risk, limited distribution, uh, like just limited permission uh, ledgers that we can do. Stuff like a private blockchain within organizations. And uh, I believe it will be a while before, or not so long before, I don't know how long it will be, before we as a society or the regulators around here totally embrace. And that's because as, as a fact, first of all, regulators will want to figure out something before they, they say we are comfortable with it. Secondly, as is usual, big organizations, big corporates will always try to like stall sporadic innovations as much as possible so that they try, so that they can lay the infrastructure themselves and be in a position to control content. So that's, that will happen and that's happening because we know uh, Vodafone is, has a working group on blockchain, but their small sister around here is not so enthusiastic. Barclays Africa, ABSA, uh, is one of the, actually just joined one of the big, biggest global blockchain uh, working groups, the R3. And so we know that people who are here are already working on blockchain somewhere else. But they're not putting as much enthusiasm in pushing for blockchain to be accepted and embraced here. So as guys, as a startup, we don't have the energy to fight that fight. It's too big for us. So what I would encourage individual uh, devs or s startups around here is to look for opportunities that are low risk, but also provide a certain value to customers and they can pay for or add to whatever they do and provide blockchain or dApps as, as an add-on to their current services. So for example, if you work in the, in the transactions 
space and you help your clients with transactions, whether they are a bank or an insurance company or whatever it is, you can try to start helping them to explore blockchain techno technology to enhance the integrity of their records. And they can do it privately, they can do it uh, at, at very low risk, and it doesn't have to cost so much. If you're in the hosting space, for example, you can be able to start helping your clients to, to create more immutable records, to, to, to secure the integrity of their, of their transactions. If you're still in the, in the e-commerce sector, for example, you can help your clients to start creating low-risk smart contracts and start making money that way. So you, before we get to Ministry of Lands doing distributed ledger, which I think will be like 15 years from now, because it's not in everybody's interest to get a high integrity land system in Kenya. That will mess a lot of people's side hustles, you know? <laughs> if I can call them that. Yeah, for example, for you to get immutable court records in Kenya. Yeah? And imagine, imagine how many lawyers will be out of work <laughs> despite that being their core job. Eh? So that is a, those are really big fights to fight. And I don't think we have the runway to do it as startups. So just look for those small opportunities with clients that already exist. As a business development person, I always fall to that default and say, I have a client, I'm already doing, doing business with them. There's this new technology which I think is fantastic. It creates trust, it enhances transparency, it is much faster, we can do it at a lower cost. How can I build something that would be an add-on to, to whatever I'm doing? So I think that's the approach we should really take as as startups and as devs. How, just explore it and ask yourself, the current clients, I mean, I'm in the hosting space, for example, how do I help them to make, it, to make their records more secure? I'm in transactions, for example, how do I help people to create small, smart contracts? Yeah, so that they can create like a history. So I think that, that is something, those are the small ways I think we should try to apply this technology and make money in the next 90 to 120 days from blockchain technology, hopefully. I'll charge you for consultancy later. Well, I think I mean, uh, that's, a, uh, that's a very reasonable perspective to take. Um, I mean, and the opportunities are there, right? I mean, everyone is talking about them. There's no reason for us to um, do it. And I, I actually personally really believe that we need to, and I'll talk about this a little bit in the closing remarks, that um, for us to um, be first on these technologies is perfectly okay. It's like I don't see a reason why we shouldn't, right? Um, and I also, to some extent, agree with you that you know, I mean, if you think about the fact that M-Pesa today, or since last year, since 2015, has universal access, which means every adult in Kenya has access to M-Pesa. There is no other payment mechanism in the world that has achieved the same thing, right? So, of course, you know, it's been eight years, so I'm wondering what have we been doing in the last eight years um, so that we haven't come up with something new. Uh, it doesn't have to be in the payment space. I'm personally not so convinced that the blockchain is that, and no offense, right? I mean, it's like, you know, I, I think that there will be probably other areas where we can succeed faster because of regulatory issues. Uh, than necessarily in the payment space, right? Um, but that remains to be seen. Let me quickly um, ask the audience for questions. Are there any questions? I asked a lot of questions, so I was expecting you guys to be good. Well, it's Friday evening. Somebody just invited them for drinks, right? Uh, we have a. Okay, can you give some scenarios, like use cases, uh, as just bundle it in part of the consultancy? Just use cases where we could at least try to apply this technology 
in 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 small scenarios, just one use case. Um, at GitHub, we're talking to guys who want to um, roll out uh, uh, agritech solutions, particularly on micro insurance. So a farmer can um, ensure the produce he's farming and um, using a smart contract on the blockchain. And uh, basically, the blockchain can be used to sort of enforce trust because the insurance may not trust the farmer uh, in terms of saying that he actually planted the produce and the, the farmer may not trust the in insurance company in terms of um, you know, paying the claim. And I think this is probably what you're doing. So we're seeing guys coming up with solutions around that area. And they're still very experimental, early stage, but the potential for disruption is so huge that it's, you know, it's amazing once you look at this, um, this kind of thing. Then also smart energy. So imagine um, you know, you're, you're somewhere in a remote area, you have solar, solar, solar panels. You can sell excess power that you have to your neighbors instead of it going to waste. So those kind of ideas where um, you want to um, sort of uh, skip intermediaries and work on a peer-to-peer -peer basis. Okay, uh, I think a very basic uh, use case is, is compliance. As we said, transparency, when you think about blockchain or DLT or DApps application, think about how can you enhance transparency, trust, speed, cost in whatever you do for your client. So if you do, for example, work that comes very close to compliance and risk management or risk audits, yeah? And so, for example, if you manage sensitive uh, databases for your clients, or you manage or you support sensitive transactions or record storage for your clients, I think uh, blockchain would really help you to like immutably store database operation records. So, for example, like some of our at at. Optimal Consulting will do analytics projects for clients. And sometimes when you ask for data, you realize that this data has been recently changed. Yeah? And if you go to the logs, unfortunately, you even find that people have interfered with logs, which is something, which is a governance issue, right? But if you are to create a, an immutable way of keeping records of who has done what on the system, and it's easily visible to everyone, and you don't have to, to do a forensic audit for you to, to find that out, then, I mean, it will be, it, it's a very simple add-on that you can do to your clients. So that's a very simple, I think, example that you can do tomorrow if you can do what he said to your clients. So just think about transparency, trust, speed, and cost. So because sometimes you find that people have to do a very expensive uh, system audit or a forensic project to find out what went wrong with their system. But if they had an immutable way of keeping records of what is happening in their systems, it would be a very cost-effective way of, of, gov of, uh, of governing their, their systems management. Does that answer your question? Yeah, okay. Any other questions? So you're saying, <clears throat> <laughs> now that the humongous buildings that I've built on top of that title did, I can't certify the title did. But the guys who buy the slabs of the floors have to believe the title did works. Otherwise, what have they bought into? We all know about all these developments where you have a developer with some money, comes and talks to somebody who owns land, they collectively start owning a building. So, Rosemary, I'm, I'm having issues. You see, my answer to that is, and I didn't mention, I'd put a, a disclaimer, as lawyers well like disclaimers, that technology will never totally solve human errors. 
And my problem is that even when you have such an immutable technology, it completely entrenches whatever faults that were there before. You understand? Because when you have something that says, let's start afresh, let's forget the, the past, what happens to historical injustices? You understand? That's a problem with immutable records. What happens to the humanity in all of us? The problems that need to be solved. We hear titles say in Mombasa, in the coast, people say, no, this property is due what? It was for my family, my grandfather. We have it even in the tea farms in Kericho. Where people say that, look, this is not owned by this company. This is an ancestral land that was owned by this particular tribe. So technology will never be a solution. And that's where the biggest problem comes in. Our humanity is still there, but we're creating perfect technologies. So how do we merge the two? Honestly, I don't have the answer. <laughs> yeah, and uh, let me just add on that. Because this is, the, this is the danger. If we are not ready to understand what this technology that is coming to us at a such a high speed. I mean, I look at it almost every day, and the rapid innovations that are coming can actually put us at a disadvantage. There's no, technology is morally neutral. It can be used for good, and can be used for bad. So, I feel that it's really important that we try and understand what exactly this thing is, and uh, you know, mitigate against the, the risks, like Kamal, you mentioned there are huge risks with blockchain, but there are also huge opportunities. And um, just to clarify on the, on the coin, because people get confused about what is this Bitcoin. So blockchain works with a principle called tokenization, where um, there, there are two activities you can do on a, on a blockchain record, read and write. So in order to execute one of those commands, you need to have these tokens. And these tokens are now what become known as the coins. So basically, there's no blockchain platform that will be secure that does not have coins, that does not use tokens. So I think that's just what I wanted to add. And that's probably, I, so two things. Number one, I think for us to convince everybody that this, is, this technology is useful, let's try to create value in small ways. Let's try to create success in those small ways privately in companies. Once we have created success in small ways, then it's easier to have a conversation in those longer term, bigger fights, right? So I think let's focus on, and, I, and that's because necessarily we don't have the resources as startups, probably uh, startups like IBM and startups like Oracle might have the, the runway to it for 15 years, but startups like most of the ones represented here, you don't have the runway. So number two, tokenization. Because tokenization becomes one of the biggest risks when you talk about uh, DLTs, eh? because people are wondering, what if they are stolen? And with private blockchains, uh, tokenization is not such a big issue because it's not the end goal, really. People who are mining Bitcoin have tokenization as the end goal, right? But if you're building this technology for other value, for other purposes apart from just mining the coins, then the focus shifts totally from accumulating hundreds and hundreds, probably thousands and thousands of Bitcoin or Ethereum or whatever, to saying, in the process of creating these coins, what, did I serve any other purpose in terms of saving my client time or money or enhancing trust? I don't know what this, uh, the other guys have to say about that. So, Rosemary, final comment, and then we'll Yeah, close I even up. have a question now that the, our team has refused to ask. I'll ask him a practical question in regards to insurance fraud. Today, I'm tired of the car that I have. I crash it on a tree and say that I had an accident. How will blockchain technology solve that kind of human fraud? It won't solve. It will help to, you know, first of all, insurance companies already have processes for investigations, for clarifying statements that you said and stuff like that. So the thing is we want to find out if you say it that uh, your car crashed. Yes? Yo, he has an answer. He's shaking. He's shaking. Okay, let, let, me an let him answer. Uh, my name is Bogwa. I actually happen to be working on a um, telematics product. So we talk about having the single source of truth. With, um, with IoT, if you're collecting data in real time, 
that goes to the blockchain. And so I can tell events before, after, and during. And therefore, you go crash your car. But my data will do the talking and say, there are no circumstances under which you could actually do that. And again, models of insurance are changing, where as opposed to you going blanket in the sort of cover that we have now, you actually use social circles to also buffer your behavior. So you'd be better off selling it as opposed to doing what um, a lot of our, our, our people do. You get a stunt driver, go to Rift Valley, make sure it's a proper write-off. Yeah. I don't know what time the guy jumped off, but the data therein and the new models of insurance, like I think there's, a, there's an insurance product called Guevara that just picks and says, come we insure you as five people or as 10 people or as 20 people take our device, let's monitor you, so you become your own ambassadors, and you start, that level of fraud starts going out slowly by slowly. When you store that record in the blockchain, then it becomes immutable in the way that we are so looking to So it makes sense it. with IoT, yeah. not with our normal systems that don't have any technology. Right now, the whole it. industry needs to be disrupted. Yes, thank you. All right, guys, so we're running out of time. I'll spend another few minutes to close up, but first of all, uh, let me thank you all the three fantastic panelists and also the people who asked questions. Uh, I thought that was a very insightful session. Thank you so much for coming and thanks for your contribution. Thanks for having us. Thanks.